Welcome to this week's Insight Show with Eric Akopian. Uh, today we're going to be talking about re regional issues that are not uh, internal to Armenia, but uh, in uh, very critical ways could impact us. Uh, one of the things that we have discussed in the post-war period is the sort of lack of uh, situational awareness about the geopolitics of the region and how uh, things that happen, some near and some far, can have devastating impacts on us and things that we need to be aware of. Uh, the one that I'm going to start with today is the entire tension between Ukraine and Russia that is going on right now. Uh, there's been reports of significant Russian uh, troop buildups in the Russian-Ukrainian border. Uh, this is in regards to the Donbas region, which is a Russian populated region inside of Ukraine, uh, which is at this point not in the control of the Ukrainian government. Uh, this buildup is likely in response to very aggressive talk from Kiev and in Washington and frankly in other places about the importance of uh, restoring Ukraine's territorial integrity, somewhat to the kin that it spoke that, that, that a lot of the chatter that happened prior to the Artsakh war. And there's actually a direct connection to this, to the Artsakh experience, is because recently uh, the Ukrainian army has purchased the Bayraktar systems from Turkey, uh, which I think they have some notions of being able to do what the Azeris did in Artsakh in, uh, in the Donbass, which is not a very good idea given the disparity of forces that is likely to come to play there. Uh, but as with anything, I think there's much bigger uh, plays, there's much, much more important issues behind this because this, this issue has obviously been going on for years. And there's speculation that this has to do somewhat with the uh, the entire push in Washington to stop the Nord Stream 2 project from being completed. Nord Stream 2 project is a gas project uh, that will essentially hook up uh, Germany, uh, which is the most important economy in Europe, to the Russian gas supplies, pretty much to the end of the carbon era. And there's a big push in Washington to stop this, uh, partly for geopolitical reasons and partly because the United States has become one of the biggest gas producers in the world. And if Germany is not on the market, it's going to be very hard to expand U.S. gas exports to Europe. Uh, now, what does this mean for Armenia? Uh, not too much directly. However, the one thing that we do know is Armenia is one of the few countries in Eastern Europe that actually has very positive relations with the West and with Russia. That's, that's quite a rarity. And anything that uh, creates tension, sort of revives this Cold War, is actually detrimental to our to our foreign policy, because we already have very little room to maneuver at, on a state level. And the more these tensions increase, the less of a room that we have to maneuver. The best possible outcome for us is, and obviously for everyone involved, for this not to turn into a war. And uh, something that lessens tensions between East and West, and we saw some of this this week, there was a conversation between President Biden and President Putin. And hopefully this is something that can calm down because the less in the tensions between East and West, the greater the prospects for our foreign policy. Now we're going to move on to our troublesome neighbor to the East, Azerbaijan. Uh, this week, in quite an ugly display, uh, the Azeri dictator, Ilham Aliyev, inaugurated a new park in, uh, in Baku, uh, of which one of its features, if you want to call it that, was the uh, displaying of the helmet of killed Armenian soldiers people who had died in battle. Now, as with anything, you're never really gonna know if this is the case, if it's made up. However, if they're saying that's what it is, we'll take them at their word. Obviously, uh, this is quite a ugly manifestation of the country and the culture and its leader. Uh, it's almost fascist in some ways. But I think the most interesting thing, which I'm sure the irony of which they have missed, is there's only one other precedence uh, in recent history of anyone using the, this kind of display of the helmets of, of, of the opposing army's dead soldiers. And that person was Saddam Hussein, who after the Iran-Iraq war, built two massive, what they called uh, the Victory Arch, which were two replicas, bronze, uh, replicas of his hands, under which were displayed the uh, helmets of thousands of dead Iranian soldiers. Now, I think the lesson here is for Mr. Aliyev is 
uh, since he probably missed the irony of being matched up with Saddam Hussein is, those who act like Saddam Hussein usually end their days like Saddam Hussein. So don't be surprised if you, your wife, your son, or whoever you pass on your dynasty to ends up in some hole like Saddam Hussein at the hands of your foreign or domestic enemies. In other interesting developments from Baku, despite their victory in the recent Artsakh war, there seems to be a significant purge going on internally in the power structures of that country, both on the political side and on the military side. And it seems to be a consistent case in which all military heroes are being uh, eliminated one by one by the Aliyev regime. Uh, the most notable one being a general uh, from the recent war named Rovshan Akhperov, who was arrested for hooliganism and murder charges from Ukraine for many years ago. Uh, this was obviously rather oddly timed if he committed a murder that many years ago that you're arresting him now. And uh, the most notable of these changes was the firing of the chief of, uh, the chief of staff of the army, Neshmatin Sadirov. This was right before the start of the war, but this kind of firings have been going on with other people in military and security ranks. And there's two schools of thoughts with this. Uh, one group think that this is essentially uh, the regime making sure that there are no war heroes above the rank of private, except for the president himself. I think the last thing that Alayev wants is the Azeri version of Eisenhower or, or Zhukov, someone who could be have ambitions that are uh, involved taking and over or running the country. And as we know, all dictators fear that almost more than anything else. So I think he's trying to eliminate these people. But there's also a backdrop of others who argue this is actually a backroom fight between Russia and Turkey, because uh, many of the Azeri leaders, and in fact, many of the Armenian leaders, uh, general military leaders, have historically have had very close relationships, sometimes have dual citizenships, Russian citizenships. And this is a concerted effort to uh, rid uh, the Azeri military of any Russian influence. So this is an interesting development that we, we need to keep an eye on. It is hard to put your finger on it. Uh, I, but if I was to guess, I think the, uh, the former is more likely the case given the totalitarian nature of the regime and the fact that you can only have one leader and one hero. And uh, they're going to make sure that no one is in a position to challenge the Alayev clan. Now, seeing all this from Baku, what does this really mean? What does this tell us about the nature of the regime there? I think it tells us a couple of things. Uh, one is countries that have won victories or cultures or, or leaders that are secure in themselves don't act like this. They don't talk like this and they're much more secure in their position. So I think ultimately uh, these displays, uh, the ugly displays or the language that's used, the aggressive one about how we're going to take over this and this land is ours and claiming different parts of Armenia. These are not, these are not coming from positions of strength. They're actually coming from positions of insecurity. Because at the end of the day, uh, one of the things that once the Azeri people wake up from the Mayopo of victory, since Aliyev is telling them that they have one final victory and the issue is resolved, he's going to have to explain to them uh, how come that Artsakh is still standing, one. And two, uh, when he used to pride in the fact that his country had no Russian troops, uh, a good part of territory that he claims, essentially the totality of Artsakh, has become the world's biggest Russian base, which he will be very hard pressed to ever get rid of. So I think some of these protestations and the things that he says are sort of uh, aggressive talk to deal with uh, the pushback that will eventually come from nationalist circles against him. Now, in conclusion, what does this mean for us? I think we need to draw lessons here. First of all, we should always carefully monitor what they say. However, that does not mean we overreact to what they say. At the end of the day, what they say does not matter. What matters is what we do. And what we do is this. We should be focused on three things. Build a competent economy, a competent state, and a competent military. If we accomplish those three tasks, Aleyev, the other Aleyevs of the world, or other totalitarian, totalitarian leaders can say what they want. 
They will come and go with the tides, but we will be in a position to defend ourselves and the people of Artsakh. Thank you for joining me in this week's edition of Insights with Eric Kopian.